next half of football. But we can't be afraid to lose. There's no room for fear in this game. This is the New Hampshire High School Football Show. I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night! If they cross the line of scrimmage, I'm going to take every last one of you out. The New Hampshire High School Football Show is brought to you by the New Hampshire State Liquor Commission's Division of Enforcement. you got heart, charisma, and a lot of skill. And now, here are your hosts, Pete Terrier and Dave Haley from NHSportsPage.com. Clear eyes, full hearts. Let's go play some football. Let's go. Good morning and welcome to another edition, a late season edition of the New Hampshire High School Football Show. We do it for you live on the radio. Two fine stations here in New Hampshire. News Radio 610 in and around Manchester and 96.7 out on the seacoast. My name is Pete Terrier along with Dave Haley from NHSportsPage.com. Dave, it is the final, uh, well it's the penultimate weekend of New Hampshire High School Football. Last week... Uh, teams were starting to book spots in the postseason last night. Some more of that. Some other teams eliminating themselves with losses. And then there's games today and then games next weekend. And then it's playoff time in November. A lot of blowouts last night. Yeah, and, and actually last night was the first night we saw um, one team in particular start kind of resting guys up to get healthy for the playoffs. So, yeah, we're into that. Next, it, it's all over next weekend. Obviously, we know where you're going to be next Friday night. And I and I think you're talking about Portsmouth, correct? Yeah, Portsmouth. The team resting yeah. teams up. They were already in. They were playing a team that needed a win and needed some help elsewhere, and they got both, didn't they, last night? Why don't we get to the scoreboards? We'll try and sort some of this stuff out. Our scoreboard is always brought to you by our friends at the New Hampshire State Liquor Commission, the Division of Enforcement, and the Buyer's Beware campaign reminding all adults it's against the law to provide alcohol to minors. Even if your team's playoff hopes were dashed last night, don't go out and say, you know what, it was a heck of a season. We fought real hard. Let's uh, pass one around to try and uh, get over another season lost. You just can't do it. It's against the law. Here's your scoreboard from Dave Haley. Exeter with a 24-14 win over Memorial. Memorial led in this game. Uh, it was back and forth in Exeter at the end. Exeter's got a really good defense. We know that. So Exeter obviously is in. They're going to be the top seed in that division. They've wrapped that up. Manchester Memorial now. Um, it's going to come down to next weekend with that loss. Uh, it's, it's either them or Concord. But 24-14, Bill Ball's team with a win over Memorial. Londonderry with a 22-13 to win over South. What a weird year it's been for South. It just hasn't happened. Uh, so Londonderry sets themselves up for the matchup that we've been talking about quite literally since early September when they will play Salem at Salem next Friday night. We will be there, P. Terry and the great John Casty, uh, when uh, the Lancers head into Salem. Salem wins last night 12-7, to kind of a funny score, over Nashua North, a Nashua North team that's really struggled. Um, One note on that game, which I noticed reading uh, Tom King's story in the National Telegraph this morning, John Saratani, the quarterback for Salem, did not play in the game. Uh-oh. And Tom asked Coach Pike after the game, hey, what was up with Saratoni, or Saratani, I should say, and he said he was dressed, he did not play, and wouldn't give any other information outside of that. Okay. So, uh, See, I, while I'm driving, you get to read these things, so I'm glad you're here to kind of add a little insight because that is interesting. He, so he's healthy is what he's saying. Apparently, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Uh, the fact is that they had Nick Shumsky at quarterback last night, and they struggled on offense. Uh, North, it was twelve to nothing, sort of like that Londonderry South game. Londonderry was up twenty-two nothing; they were in control of that game. So was Salem, but it wasn't a offensive, you yeah. know, outburst by Salem by any means. So hopefully, Saratani's back next week for that game. Imagine that. That kid won't miss that game. Yeah. I don't think you so. You can shoot him in the leg and he'd hobble out there. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure. So that's going to be a big one next week. Um, Concord, again, we kind of alluded to. Concord put up 53 last night on Portsmouth. 53-14, to 14, Concord wins. They absolutely had to, got, to get that win, and they get it. Eric Brown's team still alive going into the last weekend. Very much alive. Um, Portsmouth right now, I, I actually got an opportunity on Monday to talk to uh, John Iafola. Offense coordinator, longtime offense coordinator for Portsmouth. He and I talked for, geez, about 45 minutes and uh, look for them to work in a freshman by the name of Cody Graham in, at quarterback next week. Uh, they're going to play Dover. 
give him some snaps because he's the future over there. And they want to keep Connor DeCessory, you know, completely healthy. How does Coach Mulvey feel about that? Because I know he's also the future of the Clippers basketball program. <laughs> he's Cody used to Graham. it. You know what's the funny thing about Jim uh, is he goes to a lot of the ports of the games, but he stands on the opposite side of the field <laughs> by himself like he doesn't want to deal with the crowd. <laughs> I, love, I love that guy. So uh, so I, Cody Graham actually is a freshman. True freshman may get the start against Dover next week. Uh, but again, Connor DeCessory has certainly been an all-state uh, quarterback at Portsmouth. Uh, they want to make sure he's completely healthy. They got Mikey Tor, who's who's got an injury over there. Uh, Joey Ozier, uh, who's been great for them, has a shoulder injury. So they're really trying to get guys healthy for that rematch against Exeter in two weeks. Pinkerton, um, f- Pinkerton uh, with a fifty-seven to nine win over Keene. Um, I like it when Keen's good, and you know, John. You know, I talked to Coach Lupa quite a while in the preseason. I knew they were going to be young, so you know, let's. I think that next year they'll be right back in the mix. But Pinkerton uh, continues to be the wagon that they have been since day one, fifty-seven to nine over Keen. Timberlane with a sixteen to seven win over Merrimack. Timberlane's got a lot of young kids. They're going to be all right. I they mean, got a freshman by the name yeah. of Jacob Post who is yeah. emerging this year. Yeah, He's scoring touchdowns. He had another one last night. Uh, I think that Timberlane. You know, I'm not surprised that they beat Merrimack. And Merrimack, they, they didn't have Grassini at quarterback last night. They had some other kid playing quarterback, from what I saw in the yeah. National Telegraph. So Yeah. Um, but Timberlands, you know, got a nice little future over there. So a uh, 16-7 win, good win for them there. Bedford remains undefeated 44-6, to as expected, over Dover. Dover battling it out. Um, uh, but right now... Uh, Bedford moves uh, is undefeated. They've already wrapped up the top seed over there, and you know for Bedford, it's if they're not UNH on the final Saturday of the season, it was a disappointment. Uh, that they, they've got tremendous talent, a really good coaching staff with Kurt Hines and those guys, and uh, they move to uh, uh, they are undefeated after that win last night. Central. So <laughs> now, now this is interesting. Uh, somebody told me that Ryan Ray is telling his kids if they can win out, they'll play in the Turkey Bowl over Trinity. Is that possible? Well, it might be, and they. By the way, they won forty-two to seven over Winnicott. Okay, go ahead. That's why that's relevant. I, yeah, um, because I believe that Central, being in Division One, gets more credit, more points, if you will. Okay. There's some kind of point system when they determine the Turkey yeah. Bowl teams in Manchester, and because Central's a Division One team and Trinity's a Division Two team, I think every win that Central gets is actually worth more. Than every tri- win that Trinity gets, so Trinity's sitting on four wins right now. I think they 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 were victorious last night, as as you'll get to in a moment. So they got five wins right now. So if yeah. each win gives them a point, and Central now has what three wins, and each win say gives them three two wins points, in a row, or even two one and a half points. So <laughs> they could end up in the Turkey Bowl against Manchester Memorial. Steve Burns is a um, he's going to get squeezed on points if, in the Turkey Bowl if, and the playoffs. I'm telling you. My phone is going to literally just start smoking and blow up if he gets <laughs> screwed out of a playoff spot by by a Milford team that he destroyed 38-13 and then doesn't get into the Turkey Bowl by a Central team that he beat 55-10 to 10 or whatever last year. I, I, I think I would have to delete him and block him from my phone oh. for a month and let him just, like, cool down a little bit. Man. man oh, and by the way, Trinity, we're gonna, well, we'll get to him. They're playing really well. But uh, I want to give credit to Ryan Ray and those guys. They kept coaching. Those kids kept playing. And um, boy, Winnicott's had a tough year, uh, but nice win there for Manchester Central. So here's where it gets interesting, folks. Kirasage, forty-one to six over Lebanon. Now this game was not that big of a blowout. It was more. I think it was twenty-two to nothing at one point, um, which is you know a, a good chunk. But Kirasage scored a lot. Like Zach, Zach Matthews, they got a kid, Riley Antel, a young kid who's very good at Kirasage. Kirasage wins. Lebanon now they're all four and three. Next Friday night. As I told people before the show, I got a text message at 6.45 a.m. today from a Laconia friend of mine saying, are you coming next week? You coming? Because it's <laughs> Kirasage at Laconia. Kennett last night came back. They were losing this game. Came back and beat Laconia. Kennett wins 30-20 to 20 over Laconia. So Laconia went up to North Conway, threw everything at them, gave them everything Kennett could handle. Kennett being a senior-laden, very good team. Wins that game right now. Kirasaj, Lebanon, Laconia are all tied at four and three. I can tell you that the computer in front of me. Oh, I can't because there's no computer in front of me. It doesn't. Well, work, there is a computer. The grammar. Yeah, it's it's a it's a black box that I can tap onto, but um, with no words on it. But um, 
the, the glamorous life of radio. Um, but Laconia is ahead on points as of this morning. Now this comes into the same thing. Lebanon beat them in the season opener. Lebanon plays Conval next week. You expect them to win that game. Right. So I'm being told that if Laconia wins over Kirasaj, Laconia has played a very tough schedule, a tougher schedule than Lebanon and, and Kirasaj. If Laconia wins, they're in at 5-3. and three. But this is all to be determined. And I've asked five different people, and, and no one is positive of what the tiebreaker is. Um, so those are the two scores there. Sauhegan with a 53-21 win over Conval. Plymouth in a game Dave Haley called 28-18 over Merrimack Valley. Chris Sanborn was going to be our guest today, but he's on the road driving. Doesn't know if he's going to have a good cell coverage. So he hopefully will be on next week. We've got a superstar guest coming up today, and I'm very excited for that <laughs> announcement. Plymouth with a 28-18 win over Merrimack Valley. So great win there for the Bobcats. By the way, Plymouth, you look at – I just was real quick – Look at their season, okay? They played Lebanon in a game where they had um, a punt return uh, called back. No, no. It was, they lost to Lebanon in the season opener when Lebanon had already played and Plymouth had a bye the first week, so they went in cold with a new staff and everything. They played at Kennett where they had a kick return for a touchdown called back, and then they had uh, a missed field goal. They were in that game all the way with Kennett. Kennett winning. Then they played Laconia. Justin Robinson's running it in to tie the game at the one. Jacob Philgate strips him for Laconia. goes 99 yards the other way, and that was the backbreaker. Plymouth ends up losing in overtime. Plymouth is very close to being in the playoffs. Right. I mean, they're like three plays away right. from being right there. So, well, they only have the themselves young team. to blame losing oh, yeah. to Lebanon. That was the yeah. killer to me. You lose Tough to Lebanon in the, in, the, in the opening game. And that put him behind the eight ball right Le- off the bat. Levin and certainly trending the wrong way. But anyway, nice win there for Chris Sanborn and his crew. Trinity, as we mentioned, 35-14 to 14 over Hanover. I love the fact that I'm now getting tweeted pictures of scoreboards from players during the game. I don't know if they're taking <laughs> from pictures. players? But yeah, I got one last night. I retweeted it. From who? Oh, God. I can't have my computer in front of me. Uh, one of the boys. Purdue, maybe? I think it was. I got to look. During uh, the game. At the end of the game, it was like okay, four at the minutes end of the left. Game. I thought you meant like, okay, no, we just was, scored another no, touchdown like to go up 21 left. to nothing. Boom, let me snap a twit pick. It was the end. It was, it was like tweeted minutes out to left. Dave Haley. 35 to 14, they beat Hanover last night. Kingswood, 35 to 16 win over Manchester West. In a game that the great John Kesty and Pete covered last night, Wyndham, we're going to talk about this, obviously, 41 nothing over Milford. Sounds like it was a tough night for the officials. And, uh, Division three Stevens thirty eight they get their first win in in a few weeks Stevens with a thirty eight to ten win over Fall Mountain Campbell thirty five to nothing over Brady I said it this week in the Thursday thoughts Campbell's defense is playing very very well that's a team on the come shut out that Brady team yep. that's impressive yep and Summersworth uh, Elijah DeJoy now up to seventeen hundred over seventeen hundred yards on the season uh, Summersworth with a thirty five to six win over Epping Newmarket Summersworth will end the season. Next Friday night, I believe it's next Friday night, but next weekend against Bo. I, th- I think that might be Saturday. I'm hoping it's Saturday. I don't but, have it in front of me. But but we'll we'll figure that one out before the end of the show. Uh, there are some games going on today and some games that are meaningful games. Uh, Goffstown at Spalding, not so much in terms of meaningful. It was supposed to be played last night. Poor field conditions at Hugo Bowen Field. So they're going to play that game today. I, I think it's tonight, actually. I blame Mike Isaac. Division 1. Bishop Gurdon, we talked about this last week. They're still alive. I yeah. mean, if they beat Alvern today, which is not going to happen in my opinion, oh, I would be surprised if it know. happened. Uh, that's at 1 o'clock at Stello Stadium. But if they beat Alvern today, they go to Nashua South. Well, I mean, are you really going to Nashua South if you're Bishop <laughs> Gurdon? They play Nashua South next weekend in the regular season finale. They win both of those games. They're in the playoffs. South is out. They play Alvern. So, interesting game at 1 o'clock. I just see Alvern taking care of business. Uh, You know, can I say this? Alvern could save a lot of editorializing and and a lot of grief and a lot of grumbling. Uh, Grumbling is probably the the G-rated word I could use Um, because I'm not sure if I can say the other word. But uh, let's put it this way. If Alvern wins this game, I think everyone in the state feels like Alvern deserves to be in the playoffs. If Alvern loses, now everyone's just going to dump on that whole division. Like everyone's, No one is going to give BG a lot of respect for getting in because injury riddle team, I get it. Young, I I got it. Their offensive line, I get this. But a lot of people are going to go, oh, what a joke of a division that is, and they don't deserve to be. If Alvern wins, 
you alleviate all that. You stuff. quiet some of that stuff down. I, I agree with you. Division two, a couple of games today. Pelham at Sanborn. Uh, Sanborn looks to be a playoff team, another one of those 500 type of playoff teams because of the setup. Monadnock plays at Hollis Brookline. That's a big one. Division three. Mascoma at Interlakes, Moultonboro. You got Franklin at Newport, Raymond at Farmington, Newt. Good one. Bo at Winnesquam today yeah. in Tilton. Uh, the uh, Tanger Outlets Field, I believe it's called. Oh, really? In Tilton, yeah. And then <laughs> well, no. Newfound, the Bears. You haven't announced our radio guests yet. Coming down the lake. To take on Dave Haley's Guilford Golden Eagles and our guest at 8.35 this morning, Guilford coach Sean Garrett. There we go. We roll out the big ones at the end of the season. You save the best for last. All right. We'll take a timeout. We'll come back. Want to get into the game that I was at. Talk about this Wyndham football team because I got them ranked fourth on my power poll ballot. You like these And guys. after seeing them in person, I don't think it's a stretch. I mean, this is a good football team. Yeah. They would be competitive at the top of D1. And after the game, I, I, I had some, uh, some uh, words with, with Bill Raycraft, the, the Wyndham coach, about that Thanksgiving Day game I'd love to see for this year, Wyndham and Salem. Yeah. But oh, that's not yeah. Happening. How great would that be? That's not happening. I, I think he thinks that Salem is still like the Bad News Bears and just Lawrence. meet out in some field someplace. Do and it. Like 10 Let's of us get will watch done. in the woods. Yeah. That would be a, a heck of a football game. All right, quick timeout. More than the Hampshire High School football show. When we return, News Radio 610 and 96.7. These guys know their high school football. It's the New Hampshire High School Football Show with Pete Terrier and Dave Haley. Coming up on 8.30 on your Saturday morning, October winding down. It's hard to believe that next Saturday when we're in here, it'll be November 1st. The season flew by. It was a lot of fun. I certainly had some fun watching one of the best teams in New Hampshire high school football last night out at Milford High School. Wyndham wins 41 to nothing against the Milford Spartans, improving to 7-0 and on the season. This is a good football team. We knew going into the year they had just about everybody coming back. And kids that worked really hard, they were disappointed in the off season after they got smoked by Trinity in the conference championship game. I think it was thirty six to nothing. And after they beat them, the, yeah, after they had blown Trinity out earlier in the season. So I think it was a couple of weeks earlier. Yeah, yeah, and they took it real seriously in the off season and hit the weight room hard. They got a good program over there, solid program, a lot of players in the system. And this is their year, really, to make it happen. Yeah. And they're doing it so far. And over the last couple of weeks, you remember earlier in the season, they were just wrecking people, just destroying people. you know. And over the last couple of weeks, though, they've had some tough games. Sauhegan only lost by 14 to them. Uh, last week, I think Pelham lost by a couple of touchdowns to them. So Wyndham had a bye last week. So, so two weeks ago, Pelham lost. Win, or excuse me, Wyndham had the buy a few weeks ago. Then they played the two games, relatively close games, if you want to call a 14-point spread close, but for their standards. So after the game talking with Coach Raycraft, I was like, it seemed that you guys really wanted to make a statement in this game, and they certainly did. And Milford actually impressed me. Could run on them. Moving the football at will. Yeah. Bryce Walker, Mark Madigan, Jahir Romney. They were mixing in a bunch of different formations, a bunch of different guys. That's what Keith Jones does well. Yeah, he mixes things out. Keith so down. many different formations. It was like a, a pro-style offense without the passing, but just mixing different guys in and, and putting them in different spots and people in motion, and they were just moving down the field just methodically. Not major chunks, but I'm talking chunks of yardage, four, five, six yards of carry. Every Once in a while they'll break one over ten yards. They fumble on, like, the two-yard line on their first possession. Wyndham gets it, pass play that gains about 15, 16 yards, and then, boom, 77-yard touchdown run by Shane LaFond. And I was talking about how Milford was shuttling players in and out. Wyndham, too. I mean, they have a bunch of different backs. I mentioned LaFond, uh, this kid Matt Shea. Uh, Curtis Jolliker, a fullback. Yeah, he's And then good. they got Kellen Bale. I, I mean, not to mention their receivers, Gallo. Anthony Gallo. Joey Frake. Joey Frake. And and yep. then I finally get to the quarterback, Brendan McGinnis, who is a physical specimen. He's a big dude, solid dude. 
and the lines are very, very solid for Wyndham. They got a bunch of good, good size, strength. Look, They're, they seem like a Division One team to me. Look, look at look at the three best teams in Division Two, clear cut, and look at their quarterbacks in each case. All right, Brendan McGinnis, you talk about big kid can throw the ball. Great, uh, John Kesty was saying to me before, great ball handler, like knows how you know can, ball faker, ball fake, yeah, and he knows how to handle the ball and so forth, so on. Look at um, Will Pollard at at Kennett. Same thing. Big kid can throw the football, can run, makes good decisions. He's in the pocket. He's looking downfield at all times. Look at Steven Hedberg over at St. Thomas. Another kid. He's got a good arm. Throws those slants. Like can put the ball right on somebody's numbers. You know, even you know, to a lesser extent. You know, Matt Swarmstead is not the passer. Those guys are, but makes plays with his feet, keeps things alive, can find guys downfield. They're using Chase, Kyle Chase on more out of the backfield as sort of like a, a Matt Forte, a guy who catches balls on the run and so forth. But the three best teams in that division, and I think we're all in agreement who those teams are: St. Thomas, Kennett, and Wyndham. I think because Kennett, Wyndham being undefeated, you have to say they're the favorites. All they got quarterbacks who can run, and you talk about Milford. They got a kid, Max Erda, that they love, and he's a, a good football player. He's from a football family, but he can't throw. Like, and if you can't throw, you make yourself very one dimensional. And I think that's what you're seeing in Division Two. Is and he's really small too. Yeah, he's a little kid. These guys are these guys look like quarterbacks. You see, Will Pollard, you know, stood next to him. He just looks like a quarterback. Like he's got good size. He's you know, kid. You know, he's going to passing camps all summer long. And I'm, I'm positive, you know. Brendan McGinnis, a kid who I've messaged with on Twitter a little bit throughout the season, make sure everything's up to date with stats and stuff. Same kind of thing. So, so when you make statements, and I completely agree with you, that these teams could compete with anyone in Division One. That's that's what the difference is because those kids could get out there against Pinkerton and Bedford and throw the football around. Wyndham kind of reminds me of Pinkerton in the way they run their offense. They use that, you know, the 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 wing running backs, a lot of motion. Uh, the quarterback under center, you know, you don't see McGinnis in shotgun. I don't know if he was in shotgun at all last night. You see Pollard's constantly in shotgun. Th- that's maybe one difference between those two teams. Um, you know, they just got a bunch of different guys that they trust, and you never know who's going to get the football. Yeah. And, you know, John was mentioning to you about the ball fakes. There were times when we when we get this video up on the website on nhsportspage.com of Wyndham's victory at Milford last night, 41-0, you're going to see me not knowing who had the football. Yeah. Like, I'm like, it's Shea. And then, they, oh, it's not Shea. It's actually Kellen Bale. It was just very, very deceptive in their line. I want to give credit to a couple of guys Especially on defense, uh, Victor Pizzotti, uh, a sophomore, number 55, he was killing people. Jolliker just hammered one ball carrier on a big play late in the game. While Milford still had a chance, you know. Uh, This kid Kyle Adamson, number 60, uh, he's a junior. Another junior, uh, Patrick Hume, number 66, who plays center for them. Uh, he's a junior, so they got a young line. The rest of the talent is mostly seniors, although um, I know that LaFond, I think, is a junior, and I believe Shea is a junior, but the rest of them, Bale and Frake and Gallo and Brendan McGinnis and Jolliker, those guys are all seniors. Uh, another kid that stood out for me defensively, Andrew Dallancourt. Now, I can't tell how big these kids are because on the Jaguars roster, they don't put height and size. But these are some big dudes and some athletic dudes. And I, I really think that they're the cream of the crop. And I haven't seen Kenneth, so it's kind of hard for me to judge. But I have seen St. Thomas, and I think St. Thomas is very, very good. The bottom line is this Division Two Final Four, if those three teams oh, all yeah. get there, and I think they will, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to yeah. be a lot of fun. I think, you know, what I again, I don't have the computer in front of me, but however it works out, who's the one seed, whether it be Kenneth, or it's Wyndham. Feels like Kenneth's played a tougher schedule, but I don't know how they determine that stuff. But whoever that one seed is, you'd like to avoid St. Thomas. St. Thomas is going to end up playing Merrimack Valley in the first round. I expect them to win that game at home. Um, and then uh, it, Wyndham's going to have to play Trinity again. And they may play Milford again. We'll have to see how that that works out. But that will be a big one um, to determine who 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 gets to avoid St. Thomas until the. 
the championship. Or you know what I mean? Who doesn't have to play him in the Final Four? And and when you think about it, St. Thomas, if they get to the championship game, they could have quasi home field advantage. Well, because it's at UNH. Okay, so, so so think of the difference between. So let's just this is just hypothetically say Kennett is the one seed. Kennett then would play the winner of that Monadnock, Hollis, Brookline, Sanborn division. Which, no offense, is going to be a way easier it's going to game. Be a walk, yeah. It's going to be a walk versus. Uh, say Wyndham's the two seed, and they got to play St. Thomas. Right. I mean, at home, but um, that's a that's a senior laden, extremely well coached St. Thomas team. So that's a huge difference. That's the points, and you know, the, it's fine. If Wyndham's playing St. Thomas, I think we would want to be covering that game. Oh my God! If Kenneth's playing St. Thomas, we yeah. want to go to that game. Whatever that game is, we want to be there because that's going to be a tremendous, and then and you're guaranteed to get a great final. All right, uh, now you're getting me all excited. We're all <laughs> Can we man. fast forward for a couple of weeks? Get excited because the Guilford Golden Eagles are on board next. There is reason to be excited. Uh, we will talk with uh, Sean Garrett, head coach of Guilford, next as the New Hampshire High School Football Show continues news radio 610 and of new hampshire high school football the new hampshire high school football show on news radio 610 and 96.7 joining us on the phone right now special guest it's a guy that we've been talking about all season long even though some people say that this guilford golden eagle team flying under the radar not on this program here <laughs> with a guilford alum dave haley in the house it's sean garrett head coach of the golden eagles he joins us on the new hampshire high school football show coach good morning and thanks for coming on good morning thanks for having me so another uh late season test it always seems like you guys are playing a, a lakes region rival you got newfound coming in just a couple of games left to go in the regular season and your team has already uh, clinched a spot in the playoffs. Now you're just kind of jockeying for seeding position. Uh, how is it when you know that you're in and you know you still got work to do, how can you work that into your preparation for the week? I uh, challenge them, I think, for us. Our playoffs started last week. That was our mentality with the coaching staff. And we're trying to get that into the kids and uh, always something to work on, like you said. Uh, work on the little things, and the big things will take care of themselves. Coach, uh, when we talked in the preseason, the first thing you said is, you know, you were you were the offensive coordinator last season, correct? No, I was JV coach last year, actually, okay. for, uh, and defensive side. So. Defensive side, okay. So you have 15, right, 15 seniors on this team? 14, actually, 14 yeah. seniors. I'm always one off. And uh, <laughs> there's another kid out there who wants to join late. Uh, but to have the kids like Max Triano on this team, you've got – um, other kids on this team, a kid uh, I want to talk about, Kyle Gaudet, David McDonald, uh, you know Carter Mercer, who stepped in at quarterback for you guys. To have kind of a group, you know, Mike Medora on the line, to have a team like this where these guys have been through it, they're kind of, before you came on, we were talking about Wyndham, and they're a team that's sort of building towards this year. You know, with Guilford, especially when you have a program in Division Three and you don't have the numbers of the bigger programs, you do build towards a year like this. But how? what has it been like to coach this particular group, a bunch of kids who, you know, they know this is their last shot and they've done the work to kind of make it, you know, possibly a really special one? Well, it, it is pretty special. I, I'm very fortunate to step into a position like this with 14 seniors in Division Three. Um the kids are always talking about Madden football, and I think uh, for me with this offensive group, it's kind of like playing Madden. Uh, we've definitely been able to put up points and yards, and it's been a lot of fun. So it's something I can't take for granted, though. Next year we're only looking at four seniors, so I'm enjoying this year. Yeah, live in the moment, Coach. I mean, forget it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> think, think about next year, next year. Uh, when you look at, at the way this uh, division is set up, and I think some – coaches in division two are, are kind of looking at d3 and saying I, I like that setup you got two different conferences you got four teams within each conference making it where in d2 and d1 it's four different conferences and you only get the two top teams so in some cases in multiple conferences there's playoff worthy teams that aren't going to make it uh, we've been talking about this londonderry salem game since week one and next week we're going to be there on friday night and Two teams going into the game at seven and one. One of them is going to come out seven and two, and they're not going to make the playoffs. In D three, you don't have that problem. So, you know, I know that you're 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 dealing the cards that you're dealt with. But do you like the way the system is set up? But where the four teams get in from from each of the two conferences, north and south, in D three? 
I think it's a great setup. Last year we had uh, more conferences, and it was the same situation with Bo and, and the teams in their conference that were probably better than the number twos in the other ones. Um, this year, at least the top three in each one are worthy. And if you're the fourth seed, I don't know if you can really argue about going in or not. You're just fortunate to be there. But, um, yeah, I think this is a better setup overall, and I hope the other divisions go to that. I think at the beginning of the season, there was a perception that the other um, conference over there with, you know, with Bo and Summersworth, um, two teams that only lost once all season long, you handed Summersworth their only loss, um, that that was the far superior division or conference. I can always get these confused conferences or divisions. But, <laughs> but, and I think Bo is, I don't think, I know, Bo is the best team right now in Division Three. But I feel like the season that you've had and the season Newport has had, Newport has been tremendous this year. They beat you guys, I believe it was 27-20 to 20, earlier in the season, uh, a game that I'm sure we will write that ship the second time around. They can count on that. But, you know, I feel like this division that you're in, this this side of the conference, actually is, is turned out to be just as strong as the other side. Do, do you feel that way? Well, it's hard to say since I've only seen Summersworth, but we did scrimmage Winnesquam before the season started. Um, so they're definitely a worthy team over there. But I, I have to say, like at least Newport and us are solid teams, and I have all the respect in the world for Interlake. Franklin has definitely improved over the season, and they gave us a, a tough game when we beat them 12 nothing earlier this year to open. So um, I, don't, I don't know if you can argue that we're weaker Probably just just as good. Yeah, I mean, you beat Summersworth. All right, so I'm, every week I'm always talking about my boy, uh, Max Triano. I kind of describe him as like a Darren Sproles kind of player. So Pete Terrier is sitting here. You're his head coach. How would you describe this kid as a football player for you? Because he seems like he's the, I'm gonna, we'll call it the emotional leader of this team. Like He's got a personality, this one. Uh, and How would you explain Max Triano to ple- people who haven't seen him play yet? I, I think you have to see him um, to, to appreciate him. Uh, the guy just doesn't stop. Um, he talks more than the other three captains combined. <laughs> he has so much energy. I mean, you could call him the Energizer Bunny. He keeps going. When he gets hit, he doesn't go down. It takes three, four, five guys to, to bring him down most of the time. In fact, there's a lot of times the coaching staff are all in the headset saying, go down, go down, because he just keeps spinning around and spinning around. And It's a lot of fun to watch him go. Coach, uh, let's talk a little bit about the disappointment of the loss last year in the playoffs. You had a home game in that conference championship game. Uh, Interlakes Moultonboro, I guess you could say, surprised you, shocked you, upset you in that game. You got a little payback last week in the regular season, but uh, how much did that go into the offseason work and the preparation for the start of this year? Well, just like our loss to Newport when we had seven turnovers, um, that's what the loss was about last year. They were a solid team, and they didn't make mistakes. Um, you know, it's the name of the game in football. Don't turn the ball over. So our last two losses, we didn't do that. But, um, you know, these kids played with Interlakes in middle school football. They know each other very well. We're close. I've uh, even been over and subbed in the school over there, so I know those kids a little bit. It was big. It was circled on the calendar. But... Um, it was just another game on the season, really. So we're expecting to get up there and cover one of your playoff games. Do I need to ask that the red, the red carpet get rolled out for us when we roll into to my hometown? Is that something we can get up there in Guilford? You got like a press box for you could create like a little media section for us, Sean. We have a nice scaffolding up there. We'll <laughs> that for you. It's not gonna be windy, is it? <laughs> let me, let me, uh, let me, not let, for you. <laughs> let me give you a word of advice, coach. All right, Chip Vizi, the basketball coach at Guilford, actually let Dave. Uh, go into the locker room and deliver a pregame speech last year. To the basketball team, yeah. All right, and I know Dave wasn't a member of the Guilford football team, were you? They didn't have a football team right. when they I was there. They didn't have football back then at Guilford when Dave was there in the, the, the late 80s, early 90s, right? When did you graduate? Let's just move on. All right. <laughs> Don't let Dave address your team because I. Oh think, come on! Uh, didn't Guilford lose that game? They got up like sixteen to four right off the bat. They yeah. needed me to talk to him at halftime again. Yeah. Don't let Dave Haley go in there and, and give any uh, pregame. Speeches. I'll get the boys ready. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> He's always welcome, <laughs> Coach. We really appreciate the time. Uh, yeah. Good luck against Newfound. And then, uh, who do you got next week in your final game? 
We finish off Friday night at Stevens. Good Halloween night. Oh, okay. Well, happy Halloween up there in Claremont. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful spot for trick or treating. That's a great spot. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And we really appreciate you coming on and and joining us. And uh, we'll see you come playoff time. Okay, thanks for having me. Have a good day. All right, Sean Garrett, head coach. Uh, no relation to Jason Garrett of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I don't believe so, but they're both having good years. Yeah. yeah, they certainly are. All right, we'll take a timeout. We'll come back. We'll wrap up the program. Uh, it's been a fun day. I want to look ahead at some of the action today, and let's try and figure out some of these playoff scenarios. Yes. Yeah. All right. The New Hampshire High School Football Show continuing on News Radio 610 and 967. Welcome back to the best local coverage of New Hampshire high school football on the New Hampshire High School Football Show, Saturday mornings from 8 to 9 on News Radio 610 and 967. Getting to the top of the hour, 9 o'clock on the second to the last week of the regular season in New Hampshire High School Football Show, Pete Terrier, along with Dave Haley, nhsportspage.com. We got John Kesty. Uh, are behind the camera filming the show as always we're going to post the show so you can watch the video cast so you can get this thing either live on the radio between eight and nine on saturday mornings on either wgir am 610 manchester area also seco signal for you 96 7 fm you can listen to it on iheart radio no matter where you are and then you can go on the website watch it on demand nh sports page Dot com. Our producer, Jeremy Mahaney, in the house. Dave's young daughter, Allison, in the house. Special day for her coming up tomorrow. Very excited about that. I'm sure she is, too. I guess a trip for to Toys R Us after the show. Oh, yeah. A spending spree, Dave? I usually have to say to her, you got 20 minutes to pick something out. And if that sounds like a lot, trust me, it'd be 45 if I didn't. So she's got 20 minutes to go through the store. So we got a special treat for her coming up. And a, and a special Halloween edition of New Hampshire High School football coming up on Friday night in a game we've been talking about all season long. It's finally here, or almost here, and it's Salem and it's Londonderry, and the winner, your door prize or your parting gift, your grand prize giveaway, if you win that game, is a date with Pinkerton the next week yeah. in the conference championship game. And, and that's what I was saying off the air is that, you know, the way this set up, I really feel like Division Three has it right. And that you don't feel like you're truly getting the eight. You're not getting the the true ba- eight best teams in Division One into the playoffs. You're not because Salem and Londonderry won't be there, and they're certainly one of the top eights. It's and, not question. And you're not getting most likely the top four teams in that final four because of the fact that you no. don't have the top eight teams. So you know what I say. So say I don't even want to pick a winner in that game, but um, I'm going to ask you to though. So so say Salem wins because they're playing at home. And then, yeah, like you said, their their prize for battling and beating a good Lunder team, their prize for finishing eight and one, is to go to the best team in the state of New Hampshire on the road and play Pinkerton. Wouldn't it be kind of neat if they went to Alvern and played like another division team, and they could get out of that division? I just, you know, I think these teams beating up each other in their own um, little divisions is is not. It's wrong. There's a better, easier way. Let's uh, let's talk about that game. Uh, you've Pretty much saying that you like Salem because they're at home. I, yeah, it's hard to pick. If it was honestly, if it was Londonderry, I'd like Londonderry. So I'm just simply saying this is like a two and a half point spread kind of game. And I like Londonderry in the game. Why? I just I just think that they're more explosive on offense. I think that Salem's got a better defense, but I think Eric Fairweather and that Londonderry offense has shown that they My can. My boy score. Matt Ryan flying around, Mike hitting Ryan. everybody. Yeah. yeah, I mean they have a better offense, I think, than Salem. Yeah. Does. And they scored 20-something against Pinkerton, 20 against Pinkerton, and moved the football. I was at the game. Um, The only time I saw Salem was the first game of the season, and they looked very, very good. Um, Barely lost Pinkerton. And they lost by seven to Pinkerton. They had the ball, like, to score to tie, They they got stopped on the one-yard line, um, but... I just think that Londonderry would win that game. If I had to pick right now, I'd say Londonderry. It's a toss-up. Uh, and we don't know what's going on with John Saratani. I was just trying to find him on Twitter and see if he tweeted. You know, To me, that's the best way to find out information. Yeah. Um, he didn't play last night. He was dressed for the game. Rob Pike would not uh, give any information. And, and I heard Tom King last night uh, talking about it on another radio show. And he said that he asked Bernie Campbell, who was like the legendary stat guy at Salem High School. And, he, you know, anytime I go to a Salem game, he always gives me a packet of stats, and he knows Salem football. And Tom King went to Bernie and said, what's up with Saratani? He's like, ah, 
I don't know. So if Bernie doesn't know, this is definitely an internal situation. Yeah. Whatever. So let's hope Saratani plays and both teams are at full strength. I just think Londonderry will win that game. That's just my prediction right yeah. now. Let's talk about D1 North where – Concord needed a win against Portsmouth. Portsmouth didn't really care about the game. I know that's kind of a harsh statement, but they didn't need to win the game. They would have rather rested up players, and I don't think Osier played last night. They earned the right to do tore, that. Yeah. Right, they earned the right to do that, and it didn't mean anything to them, and Concord whooped them 54-13, to 13, right. I believe, was the final. So Concord now gets help from Exeter, who I say, don't sleep on Exeter. They made the change to Kyle Ball, a quarterback, the sophomore. He can throw it. He can run it. He's one of the more athletic Exeter quarterbacks you've seen in a while there who can do multiple things. They don't usually have quarterbacks that run the football. This kid can. I like Exeter. I think they're a team that you got to watch for, a potential Final picture. Four team. Yes. Yeah. So now it looks like it is going to be Bedford and Memorial because Concord – you know, they, they still have to play Exeter next week. Exeter is going to ha- be the home team. Exeter doesn't really need that game. I don't think Bill Ball's going to lay down. Who's Memorial play? Goffstown? Memorial plays at Goffstown on Saturday afternoon. That's a tough one. Not an easy game. No, I, I was in the parking lot with uh, Pierre Colcord, who we had on the show last week. We talked for about 20 minutes, and he raves about that Goffstown team. He's They're like, that a good team football is tough. team. Yeah, he said those guys are tough. They're a good football team, and they've, they've played close. I don't know how Central beat them last week, but Central, as you said earlier, is turning it on at the right time. A little too little, a little too late, like Pat Benatar once said. But I think that it's going to be Concord and Bedford. I think those are the two best teams. I know Concord's had a had a tough year by their standards over the last couple of years with how good they've been, but I think that they're going to be in the playoffs against Bedford. That should be an interesting game in a couple of weeks if that's the matchup. And then you look at the situation in in D1 uh, West where if Bishop Girton wins today against Albert and then wins against Nashua South, they're in against Albert. And then we got controversy. Oh, the system's flawed. Look at these teams. That's what I'm saying. 500 teams. Alvern can alleviate a lot of headaches and a lot of – they can save about 5,000 words of, you know – uh, of analysis of why this is so wrong because yeah last year Bedford uh, beat Pinkerton early in the- we keep talking about Bedford not getting in the playoffs last year they beat Pinkerton and so that's why and then that team's going to be Londonderry or Salem and that's that's a shame so I think Alvin's going to take care of business today I think that the point is going to be moved after today so we'll see how it goes all right final minute of the show special treat Allison, Dave's young daughter. What are you, eight today? Is uh, Tomorrow she's eight years old? Yes. Happy eighth birthday. Do we have a special treat for her, Jeremy? I believe we do. All right. Here it is, Allison. It's your day tomorrow. Happy birthday to you. Toys R Us, here we come. <laughs> Happy birthday, Allison. Thank you. Eight years old. Toys R Us, 100 bucks to spend. How long is that going to last? I know. I used to get 50 back in the day. Inflation. Yeah. How that, it better last 20 minutes. <laughs> now, when she wishes on the candle, will she wish for a Notre Dame victory next week? I know they took one on the chin We got last Navy week. next week. I don't want to oh, talk Navy. about that. By the way, a guy from Florida State took off his helmet. It's a 15 yard penalty in the end zone. <laughs> we should have the ball fourth and one to win the game from the one yard line. Uh, you we must, got screwed. You mustn't have got much sleep last Saturday night. That's all the time we have. We want to thank Sean Garrett from Guilford, uh, the football coach, for joining us on the program. For our producer, Jeremy Mahaney, for Dave Haley, and John Kesty, nhsportspage.com. For the birthday girl, Allison, I'm Pete Terrier. Have a good rest of the weekend. Mark Hebert's Money Sense coming up next. <laughs>